Good morning and welcome again to Wesley United Methodist Church. If we have not yet met or connected, I'm Pastor Susan Knorr. Just a little note before we begin this morning. It looks as if we're going to be doing this for a while uh, via social media. So if you know someone who has not yet tuned in and you'd like to pass on that information or encourage them to like our Wesley Facebook page, please feel free to do so. Our scripture this morning comes from 2 Timothy 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And you're welcome to follow along. I'm using the NIV translation, or you can just sit back and listen. Hear these words. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me as prisoner. Rather, join with me in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immorality to life through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher, that is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our scripture passage is taken from a second letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to a very young man by the name of Timothy, whom the Apostle Paul has taken under his wing. In fact, in his first letter to Timothy, Paul refers to him as my true son in the faith. To put this passage into context, we need to understand that Paul is writing this letter while a prisoner in a jail in Rome. Although his life was in danger many other times, he believes that it is quite possible that he will be put to death before long, as the Emperor Nero has been persecuting Christians. Unfortunately, and as a result of this persecution, many of the believers whom Paul had been traveling with have abandoned him. This letter is almost likely Paul's last opportunity to offer support and encouragement to Timothy to stand firm and to continue to pro proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Although the exact date of the Apostle Paul's death is unknown, it is believed that it was not too long after this letter was written. In the research that I did regarding this passage, I read that Timothy had a very good reason to be discouraged as he was the pastor of a very important church in Ephesus, a city that remained pagan, and he was not being taken seriously because of his age. I'm sure that Timothy is also struggling as his mentor is imprisoned many, many miles away. Paul begins his trademark letters by introducing whom it is that, he, that is authoring the letter. He then refers to the reader, in this case, Timothy, with his greetings. Paul then goes on to thank God, despite his current circumstances, and assures Timothy that he prays for him every day. 
Paul shares with Timothy that he recalls Timothy's tears and wishes that he could be there with him. But he also reminds Timothy that it is important that he fans into flame the gift of God, which Timothy has because of Paul's laying on of hands. Paul reminds Timothy that he is to be bold, and Paul speaks to this in verse 7. For God did not give us the spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Words that I believe Paul hoped would inspire Timothy to persevere. What awesome words of encouragement to Timothy from his mentor. However, in light of the fact that today we are celebrating Mother's Day, the portion of the letter that I would most like to focus on is found in verse 5. Paul writes this, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. In those days, the world in which Paul traveled consisted of a variety of cultures. Paul, who was a Roman citizen, was born and raised Jewish. However, he had a Greek education. Because of the frequent conquests of the Jewish homeland, beginning in 722 BC by the Assyrians, and later in 63 BC by the Romans, it caused the Jewish community to be scattered throughout the Mediterranean. However, they often settled into tight-knit communities where their belief in one God, the Holy Scriptures, and the practice of honoring the Sabbath practices kept them distance from the Greeks. It set them apart. So what do we really know about these two women who are credited with having a strong positive influence on this strong man who himself has become such a dedicated servant of Christ? Lois, who was Timothy's grandmother, was a Jewish woman who was married to a man of Greek heritage. Because of her strong faith, it often put her at odds with that of her husband, his faith and his beliefs. Lois was herself a faithful Christian who truly lived a life that personified Christ living in her. It was because of Lois's faith that her daughter Eunice, Timothy's mother, also became a Christian and dedicated her life to Christ as well. It is thought that perhaps by the time that Timothy was of an age to be influenced in the beliefs and in his beliefs, that both Lois and Eunice's husbands had already died, as there doesn't seem to be any evidence of their religious or spiritual influences in Timothy's life. I read that Paul had the opportunity to meet these two women and was extremely impressed with their faith. In fact, he refers to the sincere faith that Timothy has that first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. It was Lois and Eunice together whose commitment to not just sharing their faith with Timothy, but living their faith before him that led Timothy to become the man that he was. The author of the character sketch on Lois and Eunice that appears in my Women of Faith Bible wrote that it was the lives Lois and Eunice lived in their home in Timothy's sight that was the real influence that led to Timothy's spiritual growth. She wrote that as Timothy went through life and encountered the obstacles in his life, the influence of this mother and grandmother showed him that God was up to whatever challenge he faced and would help him through it. I will share with you that my life has mirrored Timothy's as one of my greatest spiritual influence has been my mother who came to know Jesus Christ because of the influence of her mother. In fact, mom shared with me that she was attending worship services as a young girl when her mother, my grandmother, went to the altar and gave her life to Christ. I credit becoming the woman I am because of the influences of my mother Lillian and my grandmother Dolly. Many years ago, I was given the copy of a poem. The authorship is not listed. I may have shared this with you before but I'd like to share it with you this morning. It's entitled, Mean Moms. Was your mom mean? I know mine was. 
We had the meanest mother in the whole world. While other kids ate candy for breakfast, we had to have cereal, eggs, and toast. When others had a Pepsi and a Twinkie for lunch, we had to eat sandwiches. And you can guess our mother fixed us a dinner that was different from what other kids had, too. Mother insisted on knowing where we are at all times. You'd think we were convicts in prison. She had to know who our friends were and what we were doing with them. She insisted that if we said we would be gone for an hour, we would be gone for an hour or less. We were ashamed to admit it, but she had the nerve to break the child labor laws by making us work. We had to wash the dishes, make the beds, learn to cook, vacuum the floor, do laundry, empty trash, and all sorts of other cruel jobs. I think she would lie awake at night thinking of more things for us to do. She always insisted on us telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. By the time we were teenagers, she could read our minds, then life was really tough. Mother wouldn't let our friends just honk the horn when they drove up. They had to come to the door so that she could meet them. And while everyone else could date when they were 12 or 13, we had to wait until we were 16. Because of our mother, we missed out on lots of things other kids experienced. None of us have ever been caught shoplifting, vandalizing other properties, or even arrested for any crime. That was all her fault. Now that we have left home, we're educated, honest adults. We're doing our best to be mean parents, just like mom. I think that it's wrong with what's wrong with the world today. It just doesn't have enough mean moms. End quote. I will share with you that I had one of those mean moms. In fact, I too believe that she laid awake at night thinking of lots of horrible jobs to make us do, and I think that one day I made the mistake of saying it out loud. It wasn't until later when I became a mom myself that I understood. Mom didn't lay awake at night doing anything most nights after saying her prayers, and the minute her head hit the pillow, she was asleep. Exhaustion has a way of doing that to you. And although she was exhausted, she could still hear a child's cry from down the hallway. In a passage from the pocket devotional for mothers, someone wrote this, and I quote, Let the story of your children's lives be called great expectations. What you inspire them to do, believe that they are capable of doing, and that has a remarkable way of coming true. Never underestimate the power of your words in your children's lives. Though they may not realize it for years, they look to you for inspiration and identification. Who they are now and the people they are becoming mirrors what they glean from you. Psychiatrist and author Abraham Maslow was quoted as saying, it takes nine affirming comments to make up for each critical comment we give our children. Let me repeat that. It takes nine affirming comments to make up for each critical comment we give our children. I wonder, as he was growing up, if Timothy may have considered his grandmother and mother mean. For me, I will tell you that I thank God that I did have a mean mom. As I close this morning's message, let me again share with you words that were written in my Women of Faith Bible. As a woman, as a mother, as a grandmother, you have the greatest influence possible on those around you. Your life speaks volumes whether you open your mouth or not. Let us pray. Loving God, as a mother gives life and nourishment to her children, so you watch over your church. Bless these women that they may be strengthened as Christian mothers. Let the example of their faith and love shine forth. Grant that we, their daughters and sons, may honor them always with a spirit of profound respect. And all God's people said, Amen.